Good afternoon. I hope you're all well in these very unprecedented times. Um, I'm Robert Hall, and I'm the Executive Director of Resilience First. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Resilience First webinar, and thank you for joining us, the speakers and the other participants on this call today. For those of you who viewed the opening video, uh, I hope you gained a brief insight on our organization, Resilience First. Uh, by way of introduction, we were created two years ago to help build resilience in business communities, whether that be communities defined by geography or special interest. Uh, since its inception, we have attracted a wide range of major companies as champions, as well as a host of affiliated organizations and members to our network, all willing to spread the work through best practices and learnings. This afternoon, we're, we're fortunate to have a great cast of speakers who will be discussing a very important topic in the present crisis. That is the, the internet, our backbone in coping with the impact of COVID-19. I think we have all been heartened by the way the internet has held up recently with so many people working from home. I'm a lifeline for many of us uh, with video conferencing and webinars becoming the new modus operandi. But I trust you, like I, are keen to know how well it has coped with the increasing traffic and what will the future hold. So our three speakers, under the expert guidance of our chairman, Kevin Duffy, this afternoon, and Kevin's the managing director of Cyber Rescue and an old friend of Resilience First, he will cover different aspects of the topic, but I will allow Kevin to introduce the speakers, the panel discussion that will follow, and to oversee your questions, which I invite you to place in the chat room throughout the session. I should add that all the speakers' bios are in your joining instructions, and we will be producing a summary uh, at the end. So I'll now hand over to Kevin to introduce formally the session. Uh, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Robert. And thank you, everybody, for making time to, to join. We're going to make this very dynamic and demonstrate uh, resilience um, because one of our uh, distinguished speakers uh, from Nominet, the organization that maintains much of um, <laughs> the, the World Wide Web in the UK, the .UK domains, etc. The Chief Information Security Officer from Nominet, um, previously uh, in a senior position at GCHQ, Kath Golding, um, has literally had to step away to deal with um, a denial of service attack, also known as a storm, in the part of England where she's living. Um, so you're all very welcome to uh, give a big cheer uh, if and when we see Kath returning to the camera uh, in a moment. Um, we also have uh, two other distinguished speakers who'll be answering your questions as we proceed. Um, we have, uh, looking like um, he's outside um, in um, <laughs> uh, an environment that isn't yet raining, um, uh, Mr. Andrew Glover, um, and we have in um, his beautiful um, bookshelf, try and zoom in and, and see what he's reading, Adrian Criddle. Um, Andrew and Adrian, as you have seen, come from organizations that are extremely relevant um, to, to our topic today. So uh, let me start with the Intel UK Vice President and General Manager. Adrian, do you want to say a couple more words about your own personal background before we come to the questions? There you go. Sorry, I was on mute. I think that must be the new phrase that everybody kind of has, has said. I think uh, I was sorry, I, I was on mute or whatever. One of the new phrases, um, you know. Um, so first off, you know, thanks uh, to, to uh, Resilience First for for kind of uh, setting up the event. Um, unprecedented times. I know that word's been used many, many times. Um, Twenty years at Intel, um, variety of roles. Last two and a half years, really, uh, we reorganised and when I run Intel UK. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's kind of the intro. Uh, very very busy, uh, and we can get into some of the detail of what what we've been working on and, and how we've been trying to make ourselves resilient, and how we can help others uh, to be a little bit more resilient as we go forward. Fantastic, Adrian and Andrew. Your background? 
Uh, yes, so I've um, been in the IT business for uh, sort of 30 years. I've been running uh, two ISPs myself for the last uh, 10 years or so, and um, particularly chair of uh, the Internet Service Provider, so the Trade Association, uh, for the last four years, uh, which is what I'm sort of talking about. And ISPA represents the majority of ISPs in the UK, um, so right from the big ones to the small ones. And so we've got um, membership that covers, uh, provides pretty much everybody's connectivity. Well, with with our expert speakers together, we have pretty much everything covered with Intel inside and the internet service providers connecting um, and the Nominex uh, running the those web domains that are crucial for all of us. Uh, so let, let's get uh, straight to it. Um, We've talked about, yes, Adrian, you used the phrase unprecedented times. So without pretending that you've muted your your uh, your uh, microphone again, let, let's start with a question. First one that, that we have is, you know, how has the internet and technology in general coped with the challenges that have come from COVID-19? Adrian? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll leave uh, Andrew to talk a little bit more about the internet and, and, and the traffic. Uh, I mean, obviously, for the last two years, we've seen some uh, pretty incredible demand um, for computing technology. Um, as everything gets um, computed, it gets tra tra transmissioned, uh, it gets recomputed, and it gets stored. Uh, so we've seen some in incredible kind of demands, and it's you know sometimes it's a bit lumpy as people build out the data centers, then they then they consume and fill them. Um, I think when COVID came around, um, there was a, a distinct, uh, you know, kind of, oh my gosh, moment where everybody realized that, you know, being in close proximity to others wasn't really going to work. Um, and obviously, everybody kind of raced uh, to go back home. Uh, you saw what happened in the retail space. You kind of saw uh, what happened if you wanted to try and buy a, a notebook computer or any type of computer or any kind of compute device to kind of keep yourself connected. So uh, we, we saw, you know, incredible demand, um, you know, normal, the demand that you would see, uh, you know, at Christmas or Black Friday and some on top of that. Um, and for those who don't know, it, you know, it takes about uh, between four and six months to build uh, a microprocessor from start to finish. So, you know, we should have been planning for this, um, you know, six months ago, which, uh, you know, obviously you don't. So pretty much a, a lot of uh, supplies are being depleted. Um, but I think that, you know, as a company as Intel, um, I, I've always grown up with a, a sense of being prepared. Uh, and if you go back, you know, many, many years when I first started the industry almost 30 years ago, um, you know, we were talking about disaster recovery and disaster recovery sites and making sure that you could stand your business up from one site to another if it got flooded or there was a problem or electricity supply. So within, within Intel ourselves, um, in the multiple roles that I've had, uh, I ran operations across Europe, Middle East and Africa, and we had a, a business continuity plan, which means that, you know, somebody switches the power off, what happens to the business? And obviously we had a work from home policy where we would send all our people to work from home with laptops so we were very very well, well prepared um, however I think generally the industry has really scrabbled and come together uh, very nicely um, you know very collaboratively uh, to try and find as many solutions to the problems that people have in just kind of basic communications and obviously with the world of the internet and, and comms and all the platforms that it provides, you know, make, making sure that people have uh, communication. And I think communication has, has been the key part to this. So that kind of a, a little bit of, a, of an insight there, uh, Kevin, in terms of, you know, yeah. kind of what we've seen happen and, and how we've coped with it. But I can go into more detail if, if people require. That, 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 that will come up. Um, but thank you. That, that sets the, the context. Um, let's move on from Adrian to, to Andrew now. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> if you applaud Andrew, you know, you're setting the expectation high for yourself. And also for Kath, who is That's back, right. Kath, we've started on the question, which will come to you after Andrew, just a higher level, how's the tech sector uh, and internet uh, specifically uh, coped uh, with the challenges of COVID-19? Andrew. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I mean, as uh, we've already alluded to, then, um, there was a lot of scrabbling around in the first uh, few weeks or in the early stages of this, particularly by uh, government. And we spent quite a lot of time in conversation with, with government who were concerned as to how the infrastructure in the country was going to hold up. Um, and I think 
um, seeing is believing. So it's only as we've got into this, they've realized and taken a deep breath and been very grateful that actually there wasn't a meltdown. Um, we probably believed there wasn't going to be more than they did. Um, and obviously, you saw a lot of the press articles in the early days where it said, you know, the internet is not going to cope. Um, and no matter how much as an industry we said, actually, we think it's fine. Um, those sort of stories kept on appearing. The background to this is um, traffic's been doubling year on year anyway, in terms of people's usage. And as an industry, we sort of plan for um, peak events and big events. And um, if I just bring up a, a slide, um, which is actually one shared by um, OpenReach or BT, um, but it's been equally the case for a lot of providers. So it's just a sort of a standard idea. And what this is showing is um, for each day over a typical week, uh, the green line, the bottom line, is the shape of traffic on a normal uh, time, which is basically lower during the day, peak hours, uh, as you'd expect, from sort of uh, 6 till 10 p.m. at night uh, or 8 till sort of midnight, and then drops away overnight and then repeats pretty much day by day. And what we saw at the start um, so this is then from the 23rd of uh, March onwards is the top line. And what you actually see is a, a sort of flattening out of that curve. The evening peaks haven't actually haven't gone up that much, um, but the daytime did. So this is the clear impact of people moving from the office environment to home environment and a lot more sort of usage in that sort of environment. Um, but the overall peaks are a lot are below what we would expect uh, for big events uh, anyway. And that dotted line at the top shows that actually what the traffic volumes were for the um, uh, the Prime Minister's uh, broadcast on the 23rd of March. So you can see we've, we've got headroom in the capacity in the networks. But each person, as ever with broadband, has their own story. And uh, this is a generic one. Individuals might obviously have had uh, their own circumstances. But as a as an overview of um, what was going on, I think this very clearly demonstrates how um, the industry has been able to cope, but how the profile has changed dramatically. Fantastic, that is very clear indeed, yes. Um, and Kath, I'm sure uh, in your role as the CISO for Nominets, you will have seen uh, a lot of those peaks and indeed other peaks of, of challenge as COVID hit the technology sector, Kat. Um, yeah, I, I sort of echo those sentiments from Adrian and uh, Andrew. Um, so from a corporate perspective, um, Nominet uh, availability is obviously one of our, our key issues. We want to keep the internet running. Um, for those who are not aware of Nominet, we run the, we're best known for running the domain name registry for, for .uk. So we're handling um, 2 billion uh, requests every day. Um, so yes, availability has always been part of our business continuity plan. Um, and so, yeah, for us as a, as a company, it was about just um, making all the employees work from home and, and changing our behaviours somewhat. Um, but it's been largely successful. Um, and uh, I think, you know, lots of lessons learned out of it. And I think there'll be lots more flexible and, and home working at my organisation, which is which is great. Um, from an internet resilience, yeah, we we saw um, we've seen peaks in traffic. So generally, it's up about um, ten percent on normal activity levels. Um, but similarly, you know, we also see a year-on-year -year increase and fully within our, our capacity. So so no concerns there. Um, what has also been interesting, and I, and I think this is uh, often talked about with my CISO colleagues is that during this crisis, we've seen an increase in, in phishing, um, particularly using, um, you know, COVID-19 and related terms as, as triggers. Um, and also, you know, the sort of uh, track and the, the alerting over SMS messages, things like that. Um, so we've been working closely with the government, in particular law enforcement and um, MRHA, the Medical Health Regulatory Association, um, and we will suspend domain names that um, are, are selling fraudulent goods or, or looking um, 
you know, like fishing, they're going to conduct fishing exercises. So we've seen about a 30% increase in uh, the, the data that we're, we're getting from those agencies we work with. Um, now, whether the, the whole level of fishing is up, I think that's debatable. Um, for our corporate network, we're not seeing significant amounts more, but I think it's clear that the, the criminals are using these terms as, as they always do. They prey on on what um, the public are, are generally anxious about. Um, so for me, it seems like maybe they're, they're changing tactics and, and, and seeing it as an opportunity. Yes, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's, it's often the, um, the unexpected consequence of the first challenge that becomes the, the resilience crisis, you know, the, the, the cascade of challenges, the, the perfect storm, the things uh, that combine. Um, in a previous job, uh, I uh, led response for um, uh, the Fukushima tsunami, um, which of course was challenging in itself, but then led to other things. Indeed, it's got the name Fukushima because of, oh, was, was there a nuclear power station uh, that was affected? And it's not then just the electricity supply, but everybody's terror at the possibility of invisible radiation. And of course, there has been an invisible wave of attacks um, that some of the experts like yourselves have tried to make visible to executives um, as as companies have been stressed by the challenges of COVID-19, sending people home, etc. Um, there have been consequences to those challenges and bad guys coming in. Um, Kathy, if I could just build on what you were saying before then about phishing, for example. Um, what, what have been those technical dark side challenges that have followed on the internet as we've gone through COVID? I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you mean by dark challenges. Uh, I mean, how, things. Hackers, how have hackers and the bad guys taken advantage of the situation? So like I said, like I, said, I think from what we've seen is that um, they are using using these terms um to to send emails or that are, are preying on people's anxieties um and they're also you know selling fraudulent goods i think you know you hear it on uh, programs like watchdog and, and things like that and certainly we have um lots of domains that we spend that we suspend that the, the M mhra are saying you know they're claiming to sell um ppe and obviously the standards that it has to adhere to um when actually they're they're not so they're asking us to take down take down those websites um so th there's multiple layers to that i think both all at the you know selling into to government and to um you know health organizations that are, you know have been really desperate to to buy things and you know they're you know there's lots of fraudulent goods out there that's what the criminals have jumped onto but then mm -hmm. also down to the um individual individual level where it you know mass fishing um and i've seen even um you know sometimes sometimes when we when we suspend we we give them we give uh, the registrant an opportunity to say no no this was legitimate um and we get some really strange cases which are which are quite funny often they're, they're kind of uh, security companies that are doing fishing exercises themselves um, but one sticks out where it was, um, you know, uh, I think he was a teenager and he'd registered this domain and he was sending out uh, SMS messages to his friends to say, you know, you've like a track and trace message to say, you know, you've been um, assessed as coming into contact. You need to stay in for, for two weeks and seeing how they would respond. Um, and, you know, it just shows how easy it is. And, and uh Unfortunately, yeah. The, when you, when yeah. you're anxious, you know that people will fall for it, and that's what the the criminals are doing. But in this case, it was just sort of friendly. So, uh, yeah, yes. it's an interesting challenge when you do get cases like that. How how to respond? You know, um, there's, there's nothing illegal about it. So, no, I was just having fun. I didn't intend to do evil, as Google would say. But the yeah. genuine bad guys are moving fast and breaking things. And as we're all struggling to respond, keep those chips 
uh, coming through the pipeline. Uh, we need to anticipate that. Adrian, um, you must have had quite a, a challenge just continuing your own operations um, at Intel to uh, make sure that um, business continued. You were very reliant on the communications, I think you highlighted earlier, if you'd like to elaborate a bit on the things that went well and opportunities for other organizations to learn from your experience. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, obviously, we have a um, kind of an outreach IT, uh, very forward IT department as well that kind of share, uh, you know, documents. There's quite a lot of information on on, on Intel.com of, of how companies can actually kind of protect themselves. I mean, what we've kind of found, um, you, you know, with end of life of product, uh, you know, from operating system vendors that, you, you know, it's critical to make sure you keep your devices up to date. And, you know, this is going to be more and more prevalent as we go forward, whether it's, you know, a modern car, whether it's over the wire updates, whether it's just keeping things kind of up to date. Uh, you know, you keep your paperwork up to date, you keep your bank statements up to date and all that type of stuff. You know, there's no different on your PC in kind of keeping yourself up to date. So you're you're kind of protected from, uh, you know, malicious attack. I, I think as you move more into the kind of, um, you know, small, medium business um, enterprise space, um, you, you know, companies like ourselves have, have had to deploy, you know, a cyber intelligence platform uh, via a company called Splunk. So this is basically where all of the data is kind of pulled together um, and kind of analyzed. And I mean, Intel's a massive company. We have 107,000 people, but including mobile phones, we have over 200,000 devices that we have to keep safe. Uh, and somewhere in the region of, uh, you know, 8,000 servers and other devices that are either in manufacturing or in the supply chain logistics. So again, um, you know, trying to pull all this data together of, of denial of service or what's happening into one centralized platform um, ha has been um, kind of a breakthrough for us. And, uh, you know, we do kind of share, um, you know, via blog on cybersecurity, um, you know, two companies to try and learn. And, and although Intel's a big company um, with lots of resources, and I understand there's a lot of people out there that are really struggling for the resource and just trying to keep their operations up. Obviously, these things do scale up and down, um, you know, quite nicely. Um, you know, and, and I always say, and I'm no security expert, but, you know, you, you're only as secure as your weakest link. Um, and, uh, you know, everything kind of needs to be updated. And, you know, the whole tech industry has gone through uh, quite an interesting phase over the last three or four years in making sure that uh, everything can be as secure as possible. Um, but the biggest thing you, you take away is is just, you know, keep updating. I know it's annoying when those patches come through or, or those Microsoft, you're trying to switch off and go to bed and it comes up and says, your system is now updating. But, but these things are important these days, especially for... You know, as Kath said, you know, people's lives are on their PC. Uh, their banking is on there. Their, their shopping's on there. So you need to do as much as you can to kind of protect it. Absolutely. And I, li I like the point about weakest link, which is um, it can appear in many areas, uh, suppliers as well as staff and systems. And we'll certainly come back to suppliers as a, a key element in an organization's resilience later on. But there are more and more questions coming in. I'm just going to read out a few of them so that we can mentally prepare to, to answer them. Um, uh, during um, the COVID uh, focus, um, there's also been um, a lot of talk about 5G. Uh, and there's a, a general question that has come in from Neil, thank you. Just how important is 5G to the technology sector? Uh, we've also had a question um, if there was a major power outage at the same time as this pandemic, would we then be in dangerous territory if we're not already? And and a third question just to, to give you a heads up on, uh, which is quite, quite a specific one. Be interested to see if one of you wants to say that you'd like to take this on. In terms of blocking access to harmful sites, I think, Kathy, you were talking uh, about, Developments like encrypted DNS and cloud-based DNS resolution make it increasingly difficult for ISPs, uh, Andrew, you may want to come to this, make it increasingly difficult for ISPs to act as a backstop. Should the proposed duty of care in the online harms bill extend to browser companies and DNS resolvers? So we'll, we'll go through... Um, 
each of those in turn I see more are coming through already uh, but um, let's let's start with that question about 5g um, Adrian just staying with you for a moment is there anything you'd like to say about the new technologies around 5g and then I'll open it up to Kath and Andrew yeah I, I think we're, we're incredibly excited about about 5g and what it will actually offer um, I, I don't think um, everybody's completely clear what that kind of looks like um, but but certainly the bandwidth uh, the security capability um, is going to you know encourage new usage models you know new business models um, and, and new opportunities you know new opportunities for uh, you know research development uh, you know content creation um, and obviously delivering you know more rich content you know over a network securely um, you know there's obviously a significant investment that has to go into this um, and, and you know, as I know, there's a, there's a obviously a political kind of debate over what's happening with, with with kind of 5G and who are the providers. But I think I would just ask the person asked the question. I mean, yes, I think we're all excited about it. We don't quite know, as we didn't quite know what 3G or 4G was going to deliver for us. Um, you know, and as I said, if you look at 4G networks, unfortunately where I live, my broadband can be up or down. So sometimes my PC just flips between 4G and, and Wi-Fi. Um, you know that wouldn't have happened you know before 4g because 3g just wasn't quick enough to be able to do video so um yeah it, I, I think exciting um lots more to come probably gone a little bit on the back burner because of what we're coping with currently yeah and uh kath would you like to come back on that 5g um, mobile devices is that going to change the way uh, the internet is used um Yes, I mean, it, it, as, as Adrian's saying, I think, you know, the, the opportunities there and the potential are, are huge for enabling, um, you know, economy, economic business, um, you know, the, there's a huge realm of possibilities there. Um, but I think, obviously, it's it's in debate because of the, the, th the other factors, which are political and, and the security, um, the nature of the, the provider. So, um, you know, with, with those three uh, areas all pulling in different directions, I, I think it's um, I think it's a fascinating area to follow. Um, and, you, you know, you touched on, you know, we'll go into supplier security because um, I think that that is absolutely um, for me. I think it's the most important thing that CISOs and, and security professionals should be should be looking at about how to how to secure the supply chain. So I think we'll be seeing. Um, more more of that and yeah let's talk about Absolutely. it in a bit great well, we're gonna really drill into the supplier side if there's time and, and look at uh how some organizations are trying to engage with suppliers and have some external evidence um on that but let, let's deal with some of these uh specific questions um i don't know andrew glover um yep. bill um, extending to um, browser companies and DNS resolvers. Is that something you're familiar with? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Campling, for that. Um, just finishing off on the 5G, I, I'd almost take the sort of contrary of going, um, yeah. it's just another technology, um, another sort of protocol, um, but yet it's the constant evolution which allows us to deliver faster speeds, better service. And that's ultimately what it's about. So that's what everyone sort of is craving for. Almost forget what the actual technology is. Um, we just want more reliable, more resilient connections, faster speeds uh, to be able to do greater and better things. And 5G is part of that mix, just as um, fiber to the premises, uh, just as other sort of technologies are. So I would almost downplay that bit and say more about what we're trying to actually achieve with it. Yeah. Um, on to your uh, uh, DNS sort of question online, Hans. I, the background to this is um, at the moment, the internet providers, service providers with the likes of Nominet um, are actually able to um, provide a degree of control for their customers. So we can um, check whitelists, we can do the sort of Internet Watch Foundation and stop people from getting to sites they shouldn't be able to. 
And the ISPs can do that at the moment because they handle the DNS. So that's the resolution of what web address you want to get to. What's starting to happen is that um, a number of the browser companies, such as uh, Google or Firefox and, and so on, are basically going, well, we'll do it and we'll encrypt the whole thing because people live in a browser, so we'll do it. And the concern that people have got is actually, are they accountable in the same way and are regulated in the same way as the internet providers are by government and Ofcom? Um, and will they actually then follow things like the online harms bill and, and protect people? And so there's a, that's part of the debate at the moment is, well, who's responsible and are they good players or bad players? And are they going to follow the sort of rules and regulation that government set up? Um, at the moment, they're sort of outside it. Um, so we all want to improve the security of our browsing, make sure that we only get to the places we think we're getting to, that we're getting to the place that we believe we're going to. All those things are important and we need to do more to do that. Um, but there's, there's thorny issues there as to if other people start to take over the running of this, then those regulations need to apply to them, otherwise we're, we're providing a backdoor or we're, we're not providing again, again, the again, that we need. So having a proper understanding of the roles that the good guys should be playing in each part of the ecosystem, who's providing which protections, what level of resilience do you have from your suppliers and partners, can you trust them to protect you in certain ways, can you trust them even to uh, to protect your data at the most basic level? Will they suffer a denial of service attack and be unavailable? Um, will they suffer the loss of confidentiality of your data or even the integrity? Uh, that first one, availability, we've had a question in. Um, let me go back to it. If there was a major power outage at the same time as the pandemic, would we be in dangerous territory? <laughs> I guess an electricity supplier is one of the most fundamental suppliers for, for everybody. Um, such a reliable utility normally that we don't even think about how we're dependent on it. Um, so Cass, you mentioned about suppliers in general, um, maybe considering electricity, but suppliers in totality. What should companies be thinking about resilience across their supply chain in these challenging times? Um, yeah, I think you have to, uh, it's a really good exercise to to list out which of um, your organ, you know, your suppliers are absolutely critical um, to, to what you do. And yes, electricity is, is in there. Um, and I can also put it, you know, there, there's, there'll be suppliers that you won't have even thought of like i can uh, i can recount an incident quite a few years ago but um we had our phones redirected um to a mobile phone and it, it was a minor sort of fraudulent case um but it did show a, a weakness in how we worked with our supplier to to put on like a, a call divert um so so something that um you know you're often thinking about availability from a what if my phone supplier goes down or my electricity supplier goes down. But I think sometimes you have to think out of the box and what, you know, how do we interact with that supplier? And are we comfortable with um, the controls that are in place? Um, so, yes, lots of recommendations there in terms of how to deal with suppliers. But at the very least, I think it's about um, listing out who they are and making sure the contracts are, are fit for purpose for, for what you want them to do. And that, like I say, the controls around that in terms of working with them. Fantastic. So know who they are, categorize them by materiality and importance and check the contractual expectations. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes on this subject. Uh, perhaps um, given age, and Intel is such a key supplier to so many organizations and you have your own key suppliers. What's your thoughts on resilience in the supply chain? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, making sure that you have a backup supply, you know, so obviously single source supply is always a bit of a challenge, um, you know, um, but I actually think the UK, um, you know, we've done quite a lot in terms of resilience of the supply chain. 
um, you know, for ready for Brexit. Uh, I mean, you know, most of my my goods for my customers would have come in via Amsterdam, but if there was a block on on customs, I would have to find some way of pulling them in from origin, which would be from the Far East or the US. So I think I think we've kind of done a little bit like that. Uh, from a technology point of view, um, if you're worried about has somebody tampered with your device. Um, you know, there's technology that, that, that we've created uh, called Authenticate Supply. So basically, uh, when somebody opens a, a piece of equipment, they'll know whether it's been tampered from the date that it was from where it was originally manufactured. So, you know, if somebody's opened the box and added another chip or done something to it, um, you know, the Authenticate would then say, hey, problem here, uh, you know, kind of go back. So there are technology solutions kind of for that. But I think kind of, you know, on Kath's point, it, it's really more about, kind of lack of imagination, um, you know, kind of going back to 2008, who would have imagined that, um, you know, people in some parts of the world were, were taking out pretty big mortgages, but they didn't have any income? Um, you know, who would have thought that we would be sitting here today with a global pandemic, which means that we had to stay two meters away from everybody else? Um, it, it's just that we haven't imagined or we, we didn't think had that viewpoint that, oh, my God, that really could happen. And obviously, once you've thought about it, obviously you can't protect against anything. But you know, certainly you can do something. And there's a a risk scenario and a risk analysis you need to do. But but then also, I think the the real critical thing is the learning. So what what have we learned from this pandemic, or what are we learning every single day? And saying, ah, yeah, that shouldn't do that. Oh, you know, we probably should put this in place. So I think um, I, I think it's on, on multiple fronts. I mean, I mean, the main things for us is you know, look after our employees and hope they're looking after their families, you know, looking after our customers and then obviously looking after the community that we're in as well. You know, and obviously Intel, we're very, very fortunate, the company that we are, obviously we are not as impacted as others in this pandemic. So, you know, you know, we offered, a, we've opened up a 50 million pandemic response fund. Um, you know, we distributed a million pieces of personal protective equipment to hospitals. Um, I, you know, some of that ended, actually landed up in London. So, so I, I think it's just making sure that you look at those fundamentals. Are, are, can your employees operate and are they safe? You know, um, are your customers and supply chain good? And, you know, can you kind of help the community that, you, that you're in? And, and those are the kind of the three fundamentals that, that we've used, certainly during, during the last couple of months, and we'll continue to do so. Knowing your values and letting them drive what you focus on, which they are, you can't do everything. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's also what you would hope your own suppliers are doing, thinking about how they prioritise supporting you. So your three fit very well with, with what Kat said, her three. Um, <laughs> and, and do you want to try and make it a hat-trick of hat-tricks? What is your advice around supply chain resilience? Sure. I, I think... Um... It's probably not a lot to to add what what's been said, but I think um, one of some of my learnings from just running my own sort of business, uh, as Adrian was alluding to, is care of people, care of your own staff, and care of your customers. Uh, and the nature of how one does that uh, has changed. And we've seen a number of people with you wouldn't expect having mental health issues purely because of um, lack of socialisation, uh, not being able to get out. Um, so again, that throws curveballs as to how you can look after your staff when you can actually um, uh, do a whole range of things that you would normally do, like take them down the pub or, or whatever. Um, so I think, again, it's having to rethink then new ways of communicating uh, and supporting people. And that's probably been one of the biggest learnings that, that we've had almost for our own sort of business. Um, I think the other one on sort of is this isn't trying to sort of sell more connectivity, but um, you're always looking for that resilience of, of duplication. And I've run an IT support business for a number of years as well. And we've always said to sort of businesses, no matter almost what size, whatever your most critical thing is that you can't work without, you probably need more than one of them. Um, so whether that's a supplier, whether that's a service, um, so, uh, it, for instance, data centers have multiple power supplies, going back to the power question, because for that very reason, they need to ensure that they're, they're covered. It's their most important thing to keep working. And now what we found both in our home environments and our workplaces is, well, potentially the internet is the thing that allows us to stay connected. So you probably need more than one connection. 
Uh, and big businesses understand that and have pretty much always done it. But even at the smaller level, um, we know that, you know, we get, uh, we've had home workers who've, if there's been a blip for, for two minutes, they've been on the phone going, I've got two kids at home and a vulnerable elderly and I'm trying to work and on a conference call, what's happening? You're going, well, you probably also need some resilience if that's the level of dependency that you've got on something. Um, so looking at the dependency level as well as the uh, um, your supply chain, I think is probably the other one. But I'll stop at those three. Yeah, those are fantastic points. Um, and thinking about how those anecdotes you've shared uh, can be real. I'm going to just try and um, share my screen. Um, once you've gone past <laughs> sharing the sharing of the sharing. Can anybody see the executive dashboard of cyber risk on their screen? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Kath. Um, so we, we're talking about the different types of organisations that could be um, a supplier to you and you're surprised to discover that they can no longer uh, supply you. And during COVID, we have seen more organisations in a variety of different sectors um, struggling to fulfil their mission is because they've been attacked in, in the health sector. Um, what you're seeing here is a company that most of us won't be very familiar with. They're actually, though, the largest private hospital chain in Europe, Fresenius, they're huge in Germany, for example, compared with um, lots of other uh, health organisations from Novartis to, to Merck and Johnson, Johnson, for example. And it's showing that, yeah, Fresenius was breached while the hackers um, were, were taking advantage of the stress that all healthcare was having. Um, but actually, they'd had you know, a fairly poor cyber security posture in months coming up to that. Um, Marriott, maybe, was putting a lot of people uh, redundant um, in May when they had, you know, it's not the first breach for Marriott. But they've had a poor cyber security posture for months. You know, most organizations wouldn't think of them as um, a critical um, provider. Uh, but if, if you're in the supply chain that Honda uh, is providing and you woke up to find that Honda factories had been turned off after a breach, that news broke on the 8th of June. You know, if you'd had a way of looking at your suppliers to see, oh, actually, they seem to be struggling with their cyber security posture um, before then, uh, can be very powerful. Um, and we've had some near misses in the uh, supply chain during COVID-19. Um, if you're in the banking sector, you'll know very well Fenastra is one of the world's leading providers of software and cloud services to, to banks. 90 of the world's 100 largest banks um, purchased from them and a small proportion are completely dependent. So when Finastra CEO explained that they were breached uh, while implementing remote working, implementing their emergency plans for the pandemic, um, that naturally got a lot of sympathy. But of course, Bloomberg uh, didn't just interview the CEO. They interviewed the cybersecurity staff at Penastra who shared anonymously and were quoted by Bloomberg as saying that actually for months we haven't been allowed to do patching uh, because senior managers think it might cause disruption. So yeah, the platform we're looking at actually Intel is an investor in. It's something that um, Resilience First members can, can have access to if you'd like. But of course, tools like this, as Catherine was saying, simply listing uh, your key suppliers, um, working out which ones are most important to you. And then I would go one further than your third point, Kath, of make sure that the contracts are, are in place verify that your suppliers are actually complying with those contractual uh, expectations and, and resilient leaders ought to have dashboards like this uh, to compare their own organization and um, their, their key suppliers uh, with alternatives. 
let me stop sharing and uh, try and stop sharing. There we go. Uh, and come back uh, to everybody. We, we've had uh, <laughs> another question come in, sort of about the, the supply chain, uh, about Huawei. If Huawei is fully blocked, will this push back 5G? I don't know if anybody on the call, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, would you like to address that, Andrew? Sure. So um, as an industry at the moment, the, the guidelines we're working to is um, that no one supplier potentially is more than 30 or 35% of the network and uh, Huawei aren't in the core of the, the network. Um, that's okay and industry can work within that. If that was changed to fully, then uh, depending on which organizations they choose, but if they choose the one named, that would cause some people um, quite a significant change. And um, Huawei themselves have uh, are one of the sort of leading suppliers within the 5G market. They are more advanced than, than quite a number, and therefore it would have uh, um, some form of impact. Um, but we've seen a delay anyway. But if you had to start um, tooling up with the new firms to start to do it, then it's going to have uh, an impact. Um, I think we're comfortable with a restriction on the amount of dependency on any one supplier as we've been talking about. Um, I think starting to exclude some people altogether when actually other people have probably still got their chips being manufactured in China or whatever. Um, it's a much more bigger political debate, but I think excluding anyone from a supply chain uh, without good reason uh, is going to disrupt that supply chain. <laughs> I think that's a fairly unambiguous answer if we go below 35%. I don't know if Adrian or Kathy would like to add anything to, to that question. No, I think uh, Andrew covered it all for, from my point of view. Uh, I agree. So let's let's start to look forward, not just to um, technologies uh, specifically like 5G, but perhaps rules and regulations and other innovations that, that may come into our environment post the pandemic. Yeah? In the last uh, 15 minutes of this session, um, after pandemic, first wave at least has passed, and indeed in the years ahead. Can we expect to see new forms of rules and regulations? Will government be doing things differently? We, will we expect things to be different, from particularly from a technology uh, perspective? Kath, given your experience um, that you share on your LinkedIn profile, so I'm going to mention it about GCHQ. Oh, don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> Do you expect that um, the way government tries to maintain the resilience of the technology sector in particular is is likely to evolve? Um, yes, and, and I, I think we already we are already seeing that um, with uh, recent recently. Well, at the same time as GDPR, we also had the um, NIS directive, the Network Information Security directive um, and that impacted ourselves um, so yeah more regulation um, initially it's all about the the CNI the critical national infrastructure um, but it, it comes back to that um, suppliers as well because I think government are um, you know they've used cyber essentials and I think they're they're going to be using more tools like that to, to try and help secure their um, their supply chain um, and interestingly, yeah, I was speaking to um, U.S. military uh, a few few days ago, or last week, um, and they they were talking about this this problem of um, securing the uh, the supply chain, and and they'd mapped out seven layers, seven layers of their supply chain, but they could only, or they sorry, they believed there were seven layers, but they could only map out the the top three, um, and so it was about. Uh, securing that and and even though that yeah you know it's the it's the military um, so it's high grade but you know it's surprising how many people this this touches and even if um, it doesn't directly touch you I can say um, you know as a as a supplier ourselves as well increasingly 
I'm being asked to fill out questionnaires. I have to make sure, going back to your dashboard, it's important for companies to make sure that their own dashboard um, as a potential supplier looks looks good. So even if you know there aren't the rules and regulations, I think that there's increased um, you yeah. know scrupulence over you know the supply chain. So um, it, it should be a good thing to improve everybody's security posture and make it um, one of the aspects that you're, you're that you're yeah. selling on. You know, and, and and also why you're choosing a supplier is their security. Absolutely. So we can expect building on the critical national infrastructure, NIS regulations and GDPR for everybody dealing with private information, perhaps a, a government push to ensure that the cyber posture is you know, at least being looked at by companies for themselves and perhaps for their supply chain. As you say, particularly for organisations like the military, it's, it's hard to see the supplier of the supplier of the supplier. Andrew, you're very familiar with government engagement and regulations. What, what are you expecting to see in the next few years? Well, I was just reflecting as Kath was talking, but um, I think often government is actually um, compromised uh, on this because they are both trying to regulate, as we spoke earlier on, sort of online harm and trying to keep individuals safe. Um, but at the same time, they're trying to push through regulation, which means that we have to hand over all data to allow security services uh, to be able to look at anything, see anything. Um, the likes of a COVID app that can sort of tell who's stood next to who and uh, how long for all these sort of big brothers. So government's actually getting pulled in both directions at the same time and isn't necessarily the best person to, to try to uh, um, determine that. And I think most people would recognise that regulation um, is actually a blunt uh, tool of trying to actually improve the overall infrastructure or cyber security. And I think some of the initiatives that the National Cyber Security Agency have done in terms of trying to raise awareness and improve capabilities has probably been more effective. Um, so I think we're, we always try to shy away from uh, more regulation. And one of the things we are trying to do as a, an industry body is actually explore a lot more case studies on best practice, uh, because regulation is usually just a base case. And what we're really interested in is how you do you, you lift the overall bar rather than uh, just set at the lowest common denominator. Absolutely. I think there may be something to, to share on, on exactly that point if, if there's time later. Yeah, raising everybody up through engagement like this is, is going to be crucial. Asian, what are you expecting to see different from government? Yeah, but, but pr probably a couple of things. I mean, I think uh, the, 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 I think the challenge is technology is going to continue to uh, probably accelerate and can regulation keep up with it? Um, and then what does regulation look like, you know, relative to, you know, country A, country B or Europe versus America, you know, and, and, and standards that, that are going to kind of get deployed. And if you talk about or, or autonomous working, autonomous vehicles, uh, or, or, or anything autonomy, you know, are the standards going to be the same? So, I mean, technology will, keep, will continue to go very fast. I think the other thing for me is um, I, I think certainly in the short term, I, I hope in the longer term uh, that um, what we've kind of been through over the last couple of months and will continue probably for a few more weeks, months, uh, is the environmental impact, you know, and, and our – are, are we uh, will regulation will government really step up and do something um and again technology can help solve some of the challenges that we have around uh, you know the environmental impacts as well i mean just think i i haven't taken a flight uh, for business for four months um am i less productive i'm probably more productive um you know i'm not getting in my car every day driving 25 30 miles to, to commute um so, so I think that's going to be interesting to see um, how, how government comes together with UK productivity um, in, and then obviously using technology to solve some, some of those problems. But again, you know, people shouldn't be afraid of technology. It, it will create jobs that we don't even know what those jobs will be yet in, in the future. Fantastic point. Um, and a lot of us have been busy trying to maintain cybersecurity and understand how our suppliers are doing, um, engaging them for, for many years. But 
as you say, both Andrew and Asia, let's automate those things. We keep getting questions in about um, Huawei and 5G. So I'm just sharing my screen at the moment to show of um, the thousand companies we have in our dashboard. There is a certain organization um, that if we zoom in, in terms of the kind of issues it's got uh, that are visible externally and, and have been uh, for a long time, different types of technology. Those are the sort of things that if you're looking at a supplier, you ought to be able to see from the outside. And what regulators like the Bank of England, this is the Bank of England uh, questionnaire, uh, increasingly do, is they're asking uh, banks, for example, about how they understand their third party providers. Are they doing what Kat was saying about listing and prioritizing them? You know, and uh, a bank could say, yes, we absolutely do. We've got an accurate register or, or no, we don't. It's hard to tell from the outside, but increasingly there is automation and things like, well, do you as a bank think that um, your vulnerabilities um, are well understood? You might say that yes, absolutely, but you ought to be able to automate getting external evidence, which is what's shown on the right hand side that, well, actually, you might think that as a supplier, you've got those vulnerabilities under control, but, you know, the evidence from the outside, what hackers can see and what they might well take advantage of uh, during a uh, cyber attack um, or uh, a pandemic of any kind is you were vulnerable before. You didn't have strength and depth. You didn't have the resilience. And now we're not just coming at you as a supplier, but we're going across the supply chain um, to the companies that you serve. So resilience is, is certainly uh, key. We've got one last question I'm going to try and squeeze in, if that's OK, Robert, before we close punctually on the hour. Again, it's about third party risk. Um, question from Tim, I'm going to to director Adrian first. The question is, where do you see escrow in managing third party risk? I'm going to pass on the question. I'm not an expert, so. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I thought I'd throw you a tough one because everyone was reading the books behind you. Andrew, you're still out there in the, um, in the forest glade, so you can't yeah. turn around and ask a friend. Um, where do you see escrow in managing third party risk? Uh, again, I'm struggling to. I mean, I. I go back to no, that, that's absolutely fine. We obviously put this question in here deliberately to encourage everybody to join the next webinar that Robert and Resilience First will be organising, where we'll have legal experts on the call. Unless, Kath, your experience at GCHQ, escrow must have been um, a matter you talked about every day. The question is where do you see escrow in managing third party risk, Kath? I'm going to pass too. It's. Uh, I was so yeah. hoping that you would pretend that the <laughs> mic had on uh, just at that moment. <laughs> but I think that is actually a, a perfect opportunity, quite seriously, to to hand back to to Robert, because um, I'm sure that well, I very much hope there are going to be opportunities like this um, to uh, make sure that questions that we haven't had a chance to to answer get addressed in future sessions. Robert, over to you. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much. Um, this, for me, this has been a, a fascinating hour and it's covered a tremendous amount of ground because we had some real experts being able to, to cover it, perhaps not the escrow question, but never mind. Um, on behalf of uh, Resilience First and, and all the participants, uh, I would like to thank the speakers very much indeed for, and the chairman particularly for their excellent contributions today. Uh, we will be circulating a short summary um, and the slides uh, in due course. Um, so if you haven't uh, captured it all, I hope the summary will, will address that. Um, and I hope that you'll join us again on the 30th of June when we've got uh, our next webinar on, on national resilience. Uh, what does this mean? And we have someone from the cabin office uh, talking and uh, hopefully the connection will work. But uh, congratulations to you all gentlemen for making our technology work so well. I certainly enjoyed the last uh, couple of months making use of it uh, as is this occasion. And I've been staggered how successful it's uh, pulled together. So that's no short part due to all your contributions. So thank you very much. And thank you for an excellent webinar. Have thank a good you. afternoon. Thank so you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.